Hello once again dear viewers, you're watching ERI TV. Welcome to this week's Open Mic. Uh, conducting this interview with me is also Ruth Abraham from The Profile. And our guest for this evening is Ambassador Sofia Tesfa Mariam. She is the permanent representative of Eritrea to the UN. Welcome to our program. Thank you. Okay, Sophie, this is not your first time sharing our uh, floor, so you don't mind as if we uh, sometimes miss out to say, Ambassador, we'll call you Sophie. Please. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so thank you again for your time. Uh, I will start the, the question. What is the general overview of Eritrea's mission to the United Nations? So first of all, thank you for having me here again. Um, Eritrea's mission to the United Nations is Eritrea's entry to the world, as far as I'm concerned, because uh, it's a platform where you get to engage with 193 countries and many other agencies uh, of the UN uh, in one platform. Um, of course, we have different sections, the General Assembly, the Security Council, and, and the various funds and uh, programs of the UN. But it is a place where Eritrea can engage one-on-one uh, -on, -one on bilateral issues. It's also one where you can engage multilaterally on issues that are of global concern, like the COVID that we were discussing for the last couple of years. Uh, and today, the Ukraine issue at the General Assembly, as you saw, the Cuban embargo. There are many issues that come up at the UN that you get to have a platform and have a, a forum where you can express yourself and you can have uh, your say and, uh, and, and, and make a modest contribution to the discussions that are happening there. So in that sense, the Eritrean mission at the UN is the gateway of Eritrea to the world, uh, in addition to all our multiple uh, embassies around the world. At, uh, the UN mission is a little bit unique in a sense that you're dealing with 193 countries and you can have access to 193 countries and get to know these countries on a closer level. It's also the mission where it establishes relationships. Uh, so we've established a few uh, diplomatic relations that we didn't have before since I've been there. I think we did Maldives uh, most recently and we're looking forward to uh, establishing more relationship with more countries uh, as we go along and finding our niche in, 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 in the discussions and, uh, and the issues that are evolving at the UN. Okay. In a nutshell. <laughs> all right. All right. So like I've uh, introduced Ruth Abraham uh, from the profile, she has a couple of questions as well. Sure. So we will be uh, taking turns in, in the line of questioning. So. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, so over the past two years, you've been in office as Eritrea's ambassador to the United Nations. Uh, can you share your experiences with us, both the negative and the positive, your encounters? You know, I haven't had any negative experiences, very different experiences is what I've had. Uh, one of the advantages of uh, being a woman uh, PR is that you also have uh, a separate forum for women at the UN. We're very few. I think now we're 49 or 48. I'm not sure what the numbers are uh, with the many changes that are going on with these uh, uh, sections there. But having a women forum to discuss issues off the platform where all the men are mm -hmm. it gives you one separate uh, advantage uh, and also for me as a you know someone coming out of the diaspora and uh, someone who've had who had shared like all Eritreans an image of what the UN is uh, it was a very um, awakening moment for me to arrive at the UN and see the UN through a different lens uh, I went there to change the narrative on Eritrea and found myself trying to change the narrative on the UN also uh, for Eritreans and how we view the UN and its utility, what we can do, what are its uh, uh, limitations, what are its advantages. So the last two years has been more like a university for me, <laughs> learning what the UN can do and, its, uh, and, its, uh, and the many platforms that it offers you and how we could best engage and, and, and put Eritrea's interests in the forefront. So in that sense, for me, as a person uh, coming out of the diaspora, coming from Eritrea, and having this 70-year uh, baggage of the UN, uh, it was an interesting two years, but a, a wonderful learning experience for me also as a person to be able to engage on that level uh, with the... Uh, uh, you know, PRs, uh, distinguished PRs from many states who have much more experience 
And so I've been able to learn a lot from uh, the experiences of other PRs and how they conduct their missions, how they conduct their work, the issues in their countries. Um, and overall, looking at the world view also gives you an, uh, a, a good sense of where we are in the world and, and how many of these uh, interests we share with the world, but also, like I said before, how many of the mutual grievances we have mm -hmm. with so many member states uh, within the UN. So for me, it was good. it's been a, a good two years of uh, picking and choosing to see where we could best apply our our. Uh, staff, since we're limited staff, we're not limited compared to other missions. I think we're, we're finding out that we're average when it comes to the number of uh, staff members. But in our engagement, we've also been able to solidify some good relationship with certain groups within the UN system, uh, the African group, the NAM, the G77s, and, and really make uh, Eritrea more visible uh, in terms of um, the statements that we're producing there, the issues that we're addressing, uh, the positions that we're taking uh, in, on, on issues that come to the GA. Um, so in that sense, you know, it, it's, it, it's a busy job. It keeps you busy, but it also keeps you informed uh, on a lot of, on m multiple levels. And I think that's uh, uh, something that we can all appreciate <laughs> as a woman and as a a representative of Eritrea, it's always an opportunity to tell the, st the Eritrean story in many levels, you know, development issues, political issues, social issues, women issues. So in that sense, uh, I think uh, it's given me a platform to say what I've always wanted to say, but now say it globally. <laughs> so I think that's, uh, that's how I would describe my two years. It's still early. Of course, COVID took away two years and most of the stuff was done virtually. And now we're getting back to doing in-person meetings and in-person stuff. So we intend to do more <laughs> when we go back. Ambassador, now, I mean, Eritrea has been uh, calling for the UN's reform. And uh, where are we there? And how many of the member states do support this idea? Well, on UN reform, you know, Eritrea talks about the UN reforming. When we talk about UN reforming, we're talking about more the UN living up to the expectations of the people and its fundamental principles, what it was created for in 1948, to bring peace, security, development to the world, um, stop the scourge of war, as they say. But has the UN really been able to do that? And there's many reasons why the UN has been unable to fulfill the needs of the world's populations or even live up to the mandates that it, that it had. But 75 years later, I think in the 75th anniversary, a lot of countries were expressing their view on why the UN hasn't been uh, uh, able to, to do the things that it was set up to do. There's many reasons. There's, uh, of course, financial issues will always come up and they'll raise the budget as the big issue. But the political uh, space that people had, the political space that member states had, uh, is not the same as it was, uh, as it is today. 75 years ago, many African states were just coming out of independence. They're just establishing their systems of governance. And a lot of the rules and regulations then, and, and the movers and shakers at the UN were not the member states that are there today. And the member states today are demanding that the UN live up to the expectations that it was uh, established for. And I think in that sense, you know, uh, Security Council reform is a big issue that comes up uh, year after year at the UN. And, I, and when I went there, I was kind of surprised because they said it took 20 years. They've been discussing Security Council reform for 20 years. And till today, we don't have uh, a clear understanding of what that reform of the Security Council would look like. If we move on certain clusters uh, in one meeting, uh, number of permanent seats, versus the veto, versus how many uh, member states they should be on the council as a whole, regional configuration, how many from each region. You know, as soon as you resolve one issue, another issue raises on the other side. You know, The balance between uh, countries in the West and the number of seats that they have in the uh, Security Council versus Africa, which has zero seats. You know, Africa has zero permanent seats. Um, and as a country with uh, billions of people and 54 member states, it's, it's something, uh, a historical injustice is what they call it, that has to be amended. But how do you do that? 
you do it by giving Africans a seat, three, four seats regionally, and who, who gets the permanent seat, you know, which African state is going to be the, the spokesperson for, for the whole of Africa, and do we have that capacity now? Are you talking about small states, big states, population-wise, economic-wise? You know, how do you decide who is going to be this uh, 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 veto-wielding African state that's going to be on the Security Council? So the discussions are ongoing. And the discussions go on in earnest, and there's some passionate discussions, but uh, I'm, I'm beginning to think as the permanent representatives leave, and another set of permanent representatives come, and countries change, leaderships change, issues change, that the Security Council uh, reform issue is also growing and changing uh, year after year. But I think in the last couple of years, there have been uh, earnest moves by certain groups to try and consolidate at least some of the issues that we can agree on. And for Africa, it's the Esbolini consensus and the Certe declaration that uh, uh, that's the common Africa position. And we do have the representatives of the C10, who are the group of countries responsible for Security Council reform mandated by the African Union. So we usually follow the African group position on, on, on issues of Security Council reform. On General Assembly reform, general UN reform, beginning with the Secretary General all the way down to uh, uh, the last civil servant, everybody talks about reforming the UN in terms of uh, employment, uh, racial issues that they have to tackle, the number of women that need to be in the, in, 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 in the UN system and the Secretary General uh, comes off as a feminist in, 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 in that sense, in that he's been able to balance his secretary at 50-50 and, and, and get the women representation there. But it's not just about women faces. You also want the quality, you want the caliber, you want the geographical representation of women also in the UN, since the UN is supposed to be a global organization. So we would like to see more Africans in, in, in executive positions. Uh, in higher level positions, in, uh, in, 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 in agencies that, uh, you know, almost all the agencies are Western run, and we have very few Africans that are in really high top level UN positions. So a lot of work that needs to be done, but a lot of work is being done. At least the discussions are going on in earnest, and I think the, the voices are louder now, and, and people are demanding that... Uh, some changes happen. We've been able to at least get the office of uh, the special advisor on Africa to have a more prominent role for us also as Africans in the UN to help us in, in the work that we do. And uh, while it was there for a while, I don't think it was um, empowered to do much, but I think now with a new director there and uh, a new uh, processes being uh, introduced, we expect to see more engagement of Africa at the UN and more voices of Africans also uh, cementing our ideas and, and some of our issues and making priorities for some of the African issues that need in terms of development especially, so that uh, we, we have a balanced UN where it's addressing many issues on multiple levels and not just issues that are of concern to Western countries or European countries or some of the powerful countries, but mostly for Africa also. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sophie. So, uh, I think you have slightly uh, said a little about my next question, but I would like to know more about Africa Group and its influence in the UN, General Assembly or the Security Council. The Africa Group at the UN is a very prominent group. Uh, with the 54 memberships that we have, um, I think uh, and we meet frequently, almost weekly, uh, with the African group. So we address issues that are common to all of us. We address issues of candidacy. We address issues of Security Council reform. We also address issues in the Security Council. If there are issues uh, relating to Africa, if there's any dockets on Africa, the A3, the A3 plus one, actually, now that we have uh, the, the three African states and the Caribbean, also working towards promoting Africa's interests in the Security Council. Uh, unfortunately, almost 100% of the files in the Security Council are Africans. But we don't have permanent representatives in, uh, in, in, in uh, permanent seat on the Security Council, and nor do we have a veto power. Uh, so it makes it very important that the A3 speak up for Africa positions and speak up for us in a way that uh, 
creates the peace and harmony that we're looking for, the peace and stability that we're looking for, but also less interference in the internal affairs mm -hmm. of our states because sometimes the Security Council uh, ends up uh, uh, raising issues that are bilateral matter, like normalization of relations. Uh, that shouldn't be a purview of the Security Council. That should be something that two countries should be able to work towards, you know, unless it's critical to the peace and security uh, of, of, of the region or of the countries. So on those issues, the Africans are more engaged. They're discussing more about the issues. Like Ethiopia has been on the African uh, group agenda many times to explain the issues of what's going on in Ethiopia and to get support from other Africans on understanding what the uh, operations were in Tigray and the humanitarian issues and addressing some of the Security Council concerns. In that sense, the Africa Group was, was a good base for us to, to start this changing of narratives about uh, what's going on in our region. And in the Security Council, in the General Assembly, the Africa Group usually makes group statements if there's consensus and we agree on, uh, on certain issues, we allow the chair of the group to speak on our behalf uh, on issues of, uh, you know, Vietnam and G77, uh, presidency of the Security Council, on any issues that come up. We, we, we opt to sometimes have the Africa group speak on our behalf if we all agree on, on, on what can be said and what cannot be said. So the African group gives us two platforms, you know, gives us a platform to have bilateral relationship with the African states, but we also have a, a, a group that's our group that's representing us within the UN system, and it's a sizable group. So in terms of votes, in terms of uh, uh, bringing uh, our issues to the floor in the General Assembly, it gives us uh, multiple forums to bring it in. So in that sense, the African group is an effective group. It needs to be strengthened. It needs... Uh, our group, not only the Africa group, but also the African Union, uh, the observer mission that we have uh, at the UN, is not the same as the EU observer. The EU mission is much more stronger. It's, it's got more uh, clout, <coughs> more resources. So in that sense, the Africa group also needs to have a, an empowered African Union representation in at the UN. And our group also uh, does a lot of within itself, the reform of the Africa group to see where the Africa group is uh, poised to be most effective uh, in the UN. Uh, and as far as Security Council, we also push on the African common position that we have. So in that sense, the Africa group is uh, not just prominent, but also active at the UN and Eritrea plays its role there. And we do it in, through committees, we do it through our experts, we do it, uh, you know, uh, in the, in, 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 in the bilateral engagements that we do on multiple levels, not just the PRs, but my political officers are very engaged with the African group uh, mm -hmm. uh, in negotiating resolutions uh, that come up in the third committee on social issues, so uh, on economic issues at G77. Uh, our second committee officers also are engaged. So they engage in the multilateral forum, but they also engage uh, bilaterally with their counterparts and get our positions up forward. So in that sense, it's an active, it's an active platform, and it's a good platform for us, and it, and it's the easiest entryway for us uh, since we are Africans. Ambassador, um, last month we've seen uh, a group of uh, regional UN regional directors uh, yeah. conducting a visit here to uh, Eritrea, and it was uh, in huge number. I mean, twenty four or twenty five of them, um, and. Um, They've met with different government officials and uh, discussed on various topics and uh, there was the signing of the framework uh, agreement uh, between 2022, that will be in effect from 2022 to 2026. What is your view of the visit? Well, the, the visit, the launch, uh, I think was um, successful in a sense that it gave 25 uh, regional uh, directors a chance to see Eritrea up close and personal. Uh, hearing about Eritrea from the outside and then coming here and actually seeing Eritrea and speaking to officials, st speaking to the stakeholders and finding out on your own is totally different. So in that sense it was good to have them here. Uh, for me there will be future ambassadors of Eritrea because wherever they are they can speak on Eritrean issues 
with uh, you know uh, with, with 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 full sense of of, of knowing what the, what Eritrea really wants and what Eritrea's priorities are. And we were very adamant in the uh, comprehensive framework that was signed that most of these uh, programs and uh, that were going to be implemented in Eritrea would be in line with Eritrea's priorities. So right from the get-go, you have the charter <laughs> and, uh, and, and all the areas that uh, are important to us as Eritreans are also mentioned in the uh, framework agreement. And so for us, we need a new face, uh, a new face, a new launch, uh, and a new understanding of, of where we want to go. And I think uh, the resident coordinator here, Ama, has uh, done her homework and brought together, you know, very prominent uh, regional directors to, to, to Eritrea to showcase Eritrea and see Eritrea for what it is and what it's been trying to do. And even if it has grievances on how to uh, resolve some of those grievances that we have with the UN, which are legitimate grievances, we're not complaining over nothing. Uh, it's, 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 it's stuff that uh, has happened in the past, but as long as we're willing to, to start afresh, and this new engagement with the, the UN and its uh, uh, agencies, uh, this launch and what we did in Asmara, I think will give us a, a chance to renew the relationship and work uh, uh, better in the years ahead, you know, in the five years. And I think we can check each other and see where, where we are periodically to see if we're implementing some of the things that we want uh, and, and, and utilize what the framework offers for Eritrea in terms of capacity building, you know, all the resources that will, can come to Eritrea to help some of the projects that we intend to do here, duplicate, scale up some of the ones like the Areza, Areza project. You know, that is something that we could easily duplicate in, in other villages. And uh, I think uh, if we start working in earnest, we will find a, a way to, to make the UN more useful in Eritrea. And, and find uh, ourselves also uh, utilizing some of the many, many capacities that are available to us at the UN, uh, technical support, and IT, many, many areas, education, health, there's, there's many resources uh, uh, that we can tap into. Uh, and I think uh, that's what uh, this framework intends to do. And it's uh, one of the good things about this uh, framework is that uh, midway, if we decide our priorities have changed and our priorities need to be elsewhere, there's also the, 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 the capacity to change and, and, and re-modify what, we, what we've done. So I, 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 it was a good launch and uh, you know, thanks to the Ministry of uh, Development and Finance, I, I think uh, Dr. Gergis had his hands full and he will have his hands full also for the next few years. But uh, I think the whole of government came together to put this uh, 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 framework uh, agreement and, and, and reach uh, the, the, the deadline that we wanted to meet. And I, and I want us to move forward in that spirit, in, in, in the whole of government involvement in what we're doing uh, at the UN, because in the end, I can't do anything by myself. It, it, the, the work is gonna be done 90% on the ground here and the whole of government engagement in what we're doing at the UN and some of these programs and uh, funds, I think is, it's important. And I think the awareness also that this UN is ours you know, and that uh, we are a part of it. We're contributing members, we're good members in good standing. Uh, and I think some of the capacities that uh, we can use uh, that are within the UN system are ours. And uh, I think we can confidently say we will move forward uh, with a renewed spirit of cooperation with the UN and its agencies here in Asmara. And, you know, and I keep telling Ama, one of the things we need to do is take down that gate, you know, <laughs> so that it's open because that is your UN. It's, uh, it's Eritrea's UN. And it's the UN in Eritrea. And uh, we can take the gates down and, and make everybody feel like this is a, 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 a common work for all of us. We're all in it together. Exactly. So. exactly. So. Finally, Sophie, uh, you're a woman that is working on one of Eritrea's most important missions. And we just celebrated International Women's Day yesterday. What can you say regarding that? Uh, yeah. 
International Women's Day for me actually yesterday was very special. Um, I went to visit the women in Denden, the Mahbar Sunkulan, all women. <coughs> what I saw there was hope. Was what I saw there was this uh, indomitable spirit, uh, a group of women, you know, physically challenged. I don't want to say they're handicapped, you know. They're physically challenged. Some are uh, quadriplegic, some have head injuries, some have multiple injuries. And yet these women felt like there was a reason to celebrate not just womanhood, but celebrate Eritrea and where we are today. I think if you sit with a group of women like that, you come off thinking, what else is there that I can do? You know? It really made you feel small. So this position, work that we do at the UN, at the end of the day was a, a very small thing compared to what these women have done and continue to do. And the spirit that they bring to this country. It's a small group of people, but I think a very unknown people. I wouldn't have known about them unless I had gone there yesterday, and it's not something that uh, I'm sure most of our diaspora would love to, 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 to know. And know them while they're still here and sharing their stories and you know, sharing their experiences and what they bring to this country. And, and in the end, they, they, they personify this resilience that we talk about in Eritrea. Uh, they're, they're just the perfect example of what resilience looks like. Uh, for me, so you know, happy Women's Day to all the women of Eritrea. But uh, yesterday, I was blessed to to have spent uh, a few hours with the, the most remarkable uh, group of Eritrean women, and and hope to share many moments with them in the future now that I've known them, and and see what we can do also to to support them in the work that they're doing, and in in and they're not just supporting themselves, but they're supporting many. Uh, women like women like them uh, that are not members of the Mahbar but are extensions of their Mahbars also. So I think uh, kudos to the women in Denden and uh, to Hamade and uh, all the women of Eritrea and the things that we bring uh, to the table and you know, the challenges are huge but I think Eritrean women can surmount them. If anybody else can, they, uh, they can. And, uh, uh, that was my impression about International Women's Day, and I'm glad I spent it here and not in the diaspora, where it's going to be more fanfare and music and dance, but yesterday was more holistic for me, and uh, bringing it home was, uh, was a good moment. So, thank you very much for your time, Sophia. Well, thank you. The DV West, this wraps up tonight's open mic. Good night.